welcome to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, I'm happy to have Monica Sharmer Patnikar, a fractional CMO and marketing strategist with us. Marketing, your messaging, these are fundamental to the success of your business. You all know that I am insanely fortunate to have Nicole Heimer of Glory and Brand as my creative director in my ear every week, checking that we are on, on brand on all the things. It's a lot. And having an experienced strategist at your side, to me, is invaluable. As creatives, we have our superpowers. Yours is elevating spaces, creating the pretty, and infusing each of your clients' homes with their personality, and also enhancing the functionality of the space. Well, as a marketing strategist, Monica helps you communicate and connect with your real audience as opposed to the ideal audience without spending, spinning your wheels on messaging, content, ads, and tactics that don't convert. Now, Monica is going to explain this real versus ideal in the show. I know you just went, wait a second, you've talked about ideal client a gabillion times over seven years, Luann. What's going on? Well, let's meet Monica and let's find out. Hi, Monica. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. So nice to be here. Yeah. So I'm like looking forward to this conversation because, you know, it's funny. um, Marketing is such a challenge in our, I think, in our business, all the life of our business. You know, I'm personally in the middle of, you know, working and overseeing a 40 plus year business. I'm in the middle and working and overseeing a business that's at its 20 year mark. And I'm also in the middle and working in a business that it's, that it's at its seven year mark. Yeah. And there's no part that it's like, hey, this is great. It's on autopilot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wish, right? <laughs> you know, it's always challenging, you know? And, and the thing about it is, is what I know, I know from experience and my partner over at Exciting Windows, Steve uh, Wishnow, who is a marketing, has spent his entire business career, 50 years in marketing. You know, his mantra is always be marketing. So I know enough to know that I always have to be paying attention to this, but it's challenging. And what do you find with the businesses that you work with, Monica, where you're working them and coaching and mentoring and providing mark, you know, marketing liaison services for them? What, 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 do you, what is the thing? Like, what is the play, the thing that we have to get through our head first in order to wrap our heads around an effective marketing strategy? Oh, that's such a big question. I can talk about it forever, <laughs> but I love how you brought this up. So I think that it's a fundamental to business. It's one of your building blocks, your fundamentals, and that marketing is more than just, uh, you know, your paid advertising, your advertising or the organic marketing that you're doing via any of the social media channels, that there's so much more involved from getting to know your customers, you know, knowing what you stand for, uh, getting clear in your messaging, and also understanding that at the end, we're dealing with humans, right? People are buying, even if you're an online business, uh, you know, there are a lot of offline businesses I know as well, service providers, but if you're an online business, sometimes I think people forget that we're still dealing with hu- humans. It's not just numbers, not like those te- traffic numbers, thousand people coming to your website. No, thousand real individuals. Getting, Making sure we don't lose sight of that. And thirdly, I would say it's really this fact that markets keep changing, economies change customer behavior changes, technology changes. So we have to keep adapting with that. And all of Mm -hmm. that 
And that means your marketing sometimes just needs to keep changing. And why you said it's challenging. It's going to challenge because you're growing as a business owner. Your business Mm. is growing. You're going through different stages. And everything around us is constantly changing. So we have to be able to keep adapting to that and going back to just some of those basic fundamentals of business. Yeah, it is. It's so true. It's, um, you know, just when I think about it, and then, and my listeners have heard me complain many, many times the, over the fact that, you know, back in the day, marketing was something you sat down, you figured it out every quarter, you reached out to your different reps from the magazines and the newspapers, yeah. you put your buy in and you went back to work. You know what I mean? Now it's like, oh, let me like put pictures on Instagram, <laughs> let me like talk on LinkedIn and stuff. So it's, um, it's crazy. So here's the thing. Obviously, as we just said, the technology changes, the way we do the marketing changes and everything, but understanding and knowing who we're talking to, you know, we might change the way and how we reach them, but understanding and knowing who we're talking to, that's got to be age old, age old, right? Because what are you doing? And if you don't know that, right, Monica? And that that's absolutely the key and I think the most important thing because as everything changes around us and as your business grow you know you're changing maybe you're attracting more people to your business so the people are changing there but as markets are changing customer behavior changes so for some reason there is this belief I think oh but I already know my customer but you may have done that a couple of years ago or a year ago uh, and things drastically keep changing and I think staying on top of that and I always say real over ideal because an ideal is something fictitious that's in your mind No, but who are your real customers? Who are the ones who are really buying from you? Who are the ones really coming, engaging with you? Who are the ones buying again and talking to others about you? Who are they? What do they want? What are the core desires? You know, sometimes it's not problems you're solving in life. You're really fulfilling desires. And then how do they behave in your category? And what makes them really happy and delighted to keep coming back to you? So really staying on top of your real customers and who they are again and again and making sure this is a process built into your business is one of the most important points and feeds into everything else that we're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) So how do you identify real over ideal? Because I hear what you're saying. We have this tendency to tell ourselves the things we believe to be true and the things that we want to be true, right? But we often in every way, I've done so many times with my chairman of the board clients, I've so many times done the exercise of, so where do your current clients come from? And then when they tell me the answers, I'm like, okay, great. And so where's the data that shows that? And some will have, you know, recorded data and some will not. And so of course we start to implement, you know, recording where every single client comes from. But I don't think I've ever had a chairman of the board that once they went to their recorded data, wasn't surprised that, oh, I thought my customers were mostly coming from X, Y, Z. It turns out they're coming from here. And that, is, you know, that's, that's a a second disconnect of who they actually are. So talk to us about how do we get to this, Monica? How do we know who's the real customer? There are multiple ways of doing this. And I actually think it's a combination of things. So one is your own internal data, right? You have your your website data, your Google analytics, any kind of analytics you're using in the background to really use that. That's a great starting point uh, and seeing where they're coming from, who are the ones purchasing the most, from which channel they're coming from. Um, Then there's obviously customer surveys that you can send out, uh, which is a great way to start getting to know more and dive a little deeper because data will show you what's happening, uh, not really why it's happening. And that's where the third point I think is really important, which still most businesses tend to skip on, is really going back to doing deep dive customer interviews or focus groups, but where you're really able to ask the why and the motivations behind things and really go deeper into those conversations. So it's, I think three, both, all three of these levels that are really important to keep doing in your business. Okay. And so for interior designers, we, mm-hmm. you know, look, it's not that there aren't interior designers in our audience that have e-commerce, but it is not the largest percentage right. of the people listening to us today. So the largest percent percentage of, of colleagues listening to us today, Monica, are dealing with real life humans. Yeah. They might be attracting them through digital sources or they're getting them for, through referrals, but it, they're not selling 5,000 widgets to somebody in a day, to 5,000 somebodies in a day. They're having maybe 10 clients a year, maybe 40 yeah. clients a year, right? So so is that in-depth conversation one of the best places to start? 
absolutely and i actually say that for any type of business that is if uh, even if you're not doing even all the rest yet this is one of the best places to start doing those deep dive customer interviews and conversations and as interior designers uh, what i've seen a lot with service providers is you're already obviously doing conversations when clients come in right um there'll probably be some kind of an intake conversation and a lot of people say well i already know my customers because i already do these conversations and i always remind them that that's still kind of kind of a sale you're getting to know them but from a sales point of view as well right to mm. see how you can attract you're getting to know them better to see how you can best serve them at that moment in terms of from a design perspective in this case uh and doing going back to these customers and doing actually customer interviews and i love calling them meaningful customer conversations if, if that worries you when i say an interview um <laughs> then to get to know them when it's not attached to any kind of a sale. It seems the conversations tend to just be so different. It's a lot more relaxed and you are able to dive into maybe things that you would not have spoken about. And I do think that as a service provider, interior designer, you're ready a step ahead because those intake conversations will have um, given you ready probably more information than what most people have. So it's a great right. place to start. Just even going back to those things and maybe sometimes building in things like, hey, where did you, uh, how did you find me, right? Um, it's a simple qu question you could just add in even over there. But then still going back to those clients later on when you're done to say, okay, I just want, I'm just trying to get to know you better uh, so that I can better see how to serve you or more people like you as my business grows and going out there and having those conversations with them. So when you think of service-based businesses that you've worked with and mentored and coached before, you know, with an interior designer, to your point, they are, you know, look, we say all the time, it's a joke, but they know what's in the bed stand. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, they know more than, than the average garden variety person knows about their client. Yes. Okay. Um, so it's, I, I almost feel like to your point, you are gathering information mm -hmm. all through the process, but this warrants a separate, is this what you're suggesting? A separate, hey, I'd like to set up a conversation, you know, an appointment to have a conversation with you. Just what, how do you say it? Like, do you just say to help me and help my business be better to serve people like you better? Because if we're just doing it in the course of our conversations over the six, seven, eight, ten months a year that we work with a design uh, with a client, mm -hmm. we're probably not capturing it. We're probably not recording exactly. the things that we're learning, right? So, how do you suggest that somebody that really has just spent a year working with somebody set up the actual wording of now? Can I talk to you about my business? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, what I, I think there is this overall fear. I've, I've sensed this. It not just sensed it, seen it and experienced it every time with clients I've worked with. First of all, there's this fear thinking that we can't have those conversations, that people don't want to have that, people are busy. But one thing I've seen is that, especially when it's slightly, you know, with smaller business owners, um, people love helping people. In, mm. And they really do. And they would love being seen and heard and understood. And you asking mm. them kind of for their opinion and for help in growing your business so that you can serve them and other people like them better. People really do appreciate that. There are always going to be a few who say, well, I don't have the time for this. And that's okay. Um, but just going and opening up that conversation. And most people have always come back with saying, oh, oh my God, you actually took the time to speak to me. Most other businesses wouldn't do that. You really care. And each client of mine has always been really surprised at how much they've been able, how many clients actually come forward to have those conversations with them. So one, just from that kind of fear that you may be having or, or uncertainty thinking, hey, can I actually do this? Uh, it's it's hard to maybe get started, but once you do, it will get easier and you'll find that people really do help, love helping each other. So, you know, that's, it's so, it's such a great point that you made because I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, all right, well, I mean, I would do it, you know and I'm saying? I get it. I would just, do, but I was like looking for, well, what's the pretty way to say it? And I realized when you described it, Yes, people do like to help other people and people will tend to feel like, oh, you want my opinion, right? Like that is a legit, absolute, true thing. And especially what's funny because I was, you know, I was flirting around. Well, I've already been working with you for a year. Why do I want to have a special conversation? But really, when I put myself in the place of that consumer, it's like, 
we really are good friends. And now I really want to know some more meaningful things yeah. about what your experience was. Exactly. Right? About your how your experience was in the process, but also maybe a bit more about how they found, found you or how did they shop for, you know, uh, interior services in general or interior products in general. So you have to go beyond just... Uh, the questions I think you've asked, you'll have really nailed a lot more of their desires and what's going on in their life in terms of the process you work through. But then the whole thing around it and how they behave within your category and how that could have changed or where they're now and what keeps them coming back to people. Those are the questions you probably wouldn't have covered. So this will allow you to take that one step further and just really being yourself and honestly saying, hey, I, I've loved working with you. Um, I've loved working with you and the stage of my business, you know, we're growing, we're changing and I want to make sure I keep serving you and others as best as I can. So I just want to have a really generally kind of open, informal conversation with you just to ask you a few questions. Uh, would you be okay with that? You know, and try to be yourself. I always say, just try to be yourself. Don't make it so formal. <laughs> Don't worry about finding the right wordings because that's when you, if you, the more formal you make it, I think that's when people may get worried. If you just mm. be yourself, like you've always been with them, that's the easiest way to go. Mm. You know, it reminds me of way back in the beginning of the podcast, probably the first or second year, I interviewed Susan Brunstrom, and she works in the Chicago area, a luxury interior designer. And she described that um, at the end of every project, when it closes, she takes that client to lunch or dinner, whichever is appropriate yeah. for the relationship. And she tells them, I'm going to ask you about the experience of working with me and what you liked and what you didn't like. Yeah. And then she has the autopsy meeting with her team after the end of the project and after this meeting and she, you know, they evaluate, they self-assess where, what did we do well? What did, what could we do better? But they also take very seriously the feedback of this client. And so you're saying, take that and take it a step further and ask not yes. just what did you like and what went wrong, but you know, what, why did you choose me? And why, yes. how did you, you know, right? Like things like Absolutely. that, right? Why you chose me? And I was, um, I use this technique, which is actually asking stories versus just, Asking the standard why questions, because stories is what brings out emotions and feelings. Yes. If I just say, why did you choose me? Well, we get we get very rational and then we may miss out on the things that really led to the choice. Uh, I, I always like using questions and I use this with my own clients as well, where I'll say, you know, tell me, you know, what really stuck by you or some moment of in our conversation, something that really stuck by you. We, tell me a little story about that. And then things come out, which you would have never imagined uh, them talking about. Um so just always try and keep it like informal conversations and more story based. And you can always follow it up with the more traditional questions to make sure you get everything you need. So I love that. Like, tell me, tell me a time when we really felt like we hit the nail on the head for you or tell me, you know, what was the deciding factor in decide, you know, calling me initially, yeah. right? Like things like that. Tell me about that. What were yeah. you thinking? Things like that. Yeah. As open as possible. Tell me about a moment uh, during yes. our conversation. Tell me a little story about, you know, something that really stood out during the process of working together. Uh, and you, because if you say, what did you like the best? They'll come up probably, okay, we love the design. We love this. We love that. But it, when you ask, well, tell me a little story about something that really stood out during our process of working together. Sometimes you'll be really surprised of what they bring about. And it could probably be something about how you approach something and something completely different. Um, and that's usually when the surprises come out. Mm, I love it. I love it. So the thing is, this is the information and fact yes. gathering stage, right? So we've, we're getting all of this information so that we come up with who our actual real customers are. Yes. And then, then we have to perform we, then we have to do certain things in order for these, these real customers to become loyal forever clients. Right. Yes. So what, what happens in there? How does, how does, how does, how does, how does, our marketing play into that. Yeah. Monica. So once you know you have this, and like I said, keep doing this in your business because things keep changing. We translate this or uh, refine it further in case you already have it uh, to a really strong brand and brand value proposition. So so that it can translate into all your messaging. So which is you know sort of what really makes me different. That's what's really different about what we offer and what we do and how we do it. Um, what are the core benefits that we offer? 
uh, through this and benefits are on different levels. So there's functional benefits, which is what does your service product or service actually do emotionally? How does it make my client feel transformationally? How does it therefore change their life? And then you, if you want to take it even further societally, therefore, how does it affect society in general? But at least trying to move up to the emotional and transformational level, uh, I think is really important. Most people tend to stay on the functional, which is what does my service actually do versus how does it make my pe- my clients feel? So taking it to that, which then together with your differentiation and the benefits, you're answering why you, why, why mm. does your customer choose me, right? And that then translates into everything you do, your messaging, your copy, your content, um, and then combined uh, the services or products that you want to add to your portfolio, and then combined by looking into deep diving into your business data and numbers, uh, actually, you know, like how many calls did I have to do to, you know, how many prospects, how many uh, and how many converted, where were they coming from? Just understanding that journey as well from the data perspective is then we define that marketing strategy by looking at the business goals that you want to achieve, where you are now, and therefore, how do you bridge that gap using all this information that we now have and knowing clearly what makes you different and with your messaging, what that's going to be. So I, I love all this. Okay. So the question, I guess what I want to do now is I'm going to throw your strategy back at you. Is there a story that you can share with us that shows this sort of aha moment that a client that you had experience. So the aha of who the real client was or a, a story about how they learned to talk in the way that it attracts that actual real, like get us in the weeds with yeah, the story. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> let me, let me give you a concrete example. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's one of my clients and she was, uh, uh, she is a multi six figure business owner and she was trying to get to that first 1 million. Um, and she's been in, she sells um, uh, baby carriers, ethical baby carriers as products. Mm. And she's been doing all the right marketing for a really long time. So, and she's in groups where she's been learning about that. So getting tra- sufficient traffic to her website, uh, spending on advertising, doing the organic, having a Facebook group uh, where she goes live all the time. And even in, email list of I think over 10,000 people remember correctly Mm. but somehow she kept getting stuck at that same level of sales and she just wasn't going further and she was doing everything she was told spending on all that Facebook ads retargeting as much as possible um, and doing in-person events as well to sell you know to bring that experience a bit because sometimes people need to use the product and she just kept stuck. So we went back and did this work and I taught her my technique of asking stories and um, the different types of questions to ask your customers. So we helped define those questions, but I got her to go and do her customer interviews with clients. And that's an important part. I always make my clients do that because I feel that's where you learn the most from. And she started doing those conversations. And after we really got to know why people were buying it, why people, how they were using it. But the interesting thing that came about was she's like, but all the interviews I'm doing right now and the people responding, they seem to be um, um, second, third time or experienced moms. Mm. So they were on their last baby, you could say, whether it was a second or fourth or fifth. Right. And they were not coming back. And that was one of the key things we saw in our data. Her repeat purchase was low. So she had built her business 90% on constantly spending on new getting new traffic to her store on Facebook advertising. So she was exhausted and spending too much because people were just not buying again. Only 10% of her business was repeat. Um, And we realized through these conversations, wait, so these are all moms who are in their last, on their last child, you could say. They were not planning on having more. Right. Um, So I said, well, okay, so we have a choice. We either need to pivot your business here to target those moms and see what else we can add in your product services or what you offer to better serve them more uh, past this last carrier. What else could they need? Or we need to see like what's happening. Where are the first time moms? And she's like, well, I still want to figure that out. I said, let's do that. So she went back and did another shout in her Facebook group or email list and people uh, started responding. She's like, I want to speak to some first time moms and just learn more about you and uh, what you struggle with and your experience with baby carriers. And they started responding. And what we learned then through the conversations she had, those moms were lurking, they were there, but they were not buying. 
And the reason being because baby carriers, especially the ethical ones, the more cloth based, the wraps, they were hard to use and uh, or people who are experienced knew what they wanted. The other moms wanted a little more, little more guidance uh, in the mm. whole process. And it turned out that all her they, and they were there. They were all in her on her email list. They were in Facebook group. They were following her on Instagram, but they needed more guidance. And actually, a few of them uh turned into customers after the conversations she had with them because they got a bit more guidance into what they wanted. And we realized that her whole messaging and her whole, especially content was geared towards um, people who already knew what they wanted. Whereas now she could go out and create content and blog posts and create a quiz to help make you make that decision in your buying journey. So instead of just selling, kind of really helping these moms into deciding what they buy and as you can see that already changed her messaging but also the kind of content she put on she could put content for you know experienced moms who already have a child you carry a different carrier versus somebody's on their first child somebody who may be having some physical ailments uh somebody who's pregnant and having a uh also has a child at home. So we started creating content and saying, okay, these are content pillars that you can focus on. Create a quiz as an opt-in where you can guide somebody through that journey as well of, hey, this is the best key options for you. We saw that one of her products, for example, had a really high return rate and it was the most complicated product to have, but it was the one most recommended in a lot of other mommy Facebook groups. So I said, well, add a difficulty rating or how easy or difficult it is to use. And she immediately saw a drop in return those sales but returns as well and people writing in oh i see that's a more difficult one to use what would you recommend instead so by changing from all her messaging into her content pillars into what you would put on her product pages um and then therefore starting to make that you know moving into i'm helping you make the best choice versus just trying to sell these baby carriers and that kind of just totally changed the way she thought about approaching her customers and the mindset shift that happened and especially the mindset shift that happened for her over there Mm. well it's very powerful what you're describing because not only you know you know she had the proof that she had the first time moms in the group but when they're not the ones buying to understand that yeah, the like you could almost it was almost like there was an intimidation factor on first time moms, either they, yeah. they were intimidated by the product or the other thing is, you know, a first time mom really sometimes doesn't know what they need. They exactly. don't know what they don't know. Yes. Right. And so it's so it's such a simple thing. And when I think about interior designers, it's it's what we say all the time. We know what we do so well that we don't realize what are the gaps in the information that our potential consumer has. And so for interior designers, I know that in the beginning, when you are starting, like if if you happen to launch your business and you hit luxury right out the gate, whatever your background is and whatever your experience is as it does as a designer, maybe you spent five or 10 years working for a luxury firm. Maybe you come from another industry and you immediately bring your luxury clients with you, whatever it is. That's less of a thing. But when you're earlier in your career and less experienced, your clients, your potential clients also are more likely to have less experience with working with a designer. And so you, I could see the exact same thing happening. Them being in your Instagram, being on your email list, if you've got one, being in your Facebook, you know, world and just being like, I don't know what it means to work with a designer. So if I ask her, then I'm going to be embarrassed. It's almost like if you have to ask how expensive it is, you probably can't afford it. So if I have to ask how it works to work with a designer, then maybe the designer is going to think I'm, you know, dumb or something. Right. So starting by educating them is, is a, yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. You mentioned in there that you have four types of questions to ask. Is it something that we could run through? Yeah, sure. So um, I have four kind of uh, category of questions. So I call it the four D's or desires over demographics framework. So the first D is definitely just demographics, but that's just more to make sure you have your basis covered uh, and you roughly know we know which kind of age group or uh, kind of people you're targeting. And that can be anything from age, income, ethnicity, you know, house owners, not owners, you fill that in as per what you need for your business. Then the core one I say is the second D, which is desires. Um, What are you really fulfilling for them? And especially I think what I also love saying, it's not always solving problems. You know, you're not having like a tech 
product or something and you're solving somebody's problems, you're fulfilling a desire for them, right? Um, what is those desires? What's going on in their life right now? What do they really want? What's, what's, what's stopping them from getting there? What are their struggles or what makes them happy, right? Getting to know them at that level uh, is the second box, desires. Then the second, a third one is what I call do. So how do, what are they doing? How are they behaving within your category? So within the interior design space. So how did they find you? Uh, are they looking at, you know, are they comparing you with other design firms? Um, how do they make that choice? Have they used services before or not? Is this the first time? So getting to know that journey that they take to even come to that decision to work with you and what really influences that? What are the triggers to say yes to working with the interior designer? What are the barriers maybe happening? And then the last one is delight. What really makes them happy throughout this experience of discovery, but also working with you and what would make them and what are the triggers and barriers to get them to come back to you? What would they tell others about you uh, if they're talking about you? So those are the four Ds. So demographics, desires, do and delight. I love it. I love it. It's, um, you know, the thing about it is, is you run through the question, you know, the areas, but when you think about it, you really could come up with multiple questions within each of these to really yeah. dig in and get to it. Right. And that's the point. You're not saying just one question per category. No, like, no, no. Think no. about these. Yeah. And, and, and these are the things that, is this the framework for when you do have that meaningful conversation slash interview with your current clients? Is this the types of things that you're going to send to your questions around, Monica? Yeah. So this is what I use as well with my clients. And as uh, and this is kind of what I help them with when they're speaking to their customers and clients. And so what is the, what is the connection then when we, when we talk about converting customers to loyal yeah. raving clients is it literally just the key is really understanding all their motivations like what is that connection? i think i think it's multiple things so it starts with this this is a fundamental that feeds into it but then i said like like i explained it it translates into your content, your messaging, or um, if you have a, you know, you have a brick and mortar, when, when you answer the phone, how is that done? How do you solve things? So it's about how you then serve them at every touch point that they connect with you with. So if they're finding you on the Instagram, what are you, that, that, and when they are calling you in the office, that there is going to be a consistency, how you approach them and how you work with them throughout the entire experience. It's it's so hard to sometimes articulate because I always say brand is a feeling, right? It's it's how mm. you make them feel at every step of the customer journey, at every time that they interact with you, whether it's seeing you on social media and email they're receiving you, they're calling, uh, filling up a form, they are calling you or they're coming and meeting you uh, and having a conversation with you and, and then they're working with you through that entire process and even when they're done working with you how do you make them feel every step and that you're consistently translating that across the whole journey yeah it's um it's a big yeah. thing i mean we 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 know when major brands have done it right like i mean it, it, i can I can complain about my phone once a week over something, but then when somebody says, "Oh, would you switch to Android?" I'd be like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, then I'll just wait for Apple to yeah. fix it. Like, stop. <laughs> I have a great example. Just this last week, so uh, we have a a company where we buy all our electronics from here in Holland, so in Amsterdam, where I am. Uh, it's called Cool Blue, and they've always been known for like kind of making you smile. That's like their concept as well behind it and really making it easy. And they started off online first and then they started adding service centers uh, so that you also have places where you can go for your repairs and you can meet somebody in person. They have a 24 hour helpline. But when you go and meet them, when you go and talk to them, they're also um, living it in other ways. So they'll have this coffee machine. Where if you're out in the service center where you can have some tea, coffee, hot chocolate, little couches to make it feel comfortable to wait. And then when I was talking to them and while we were waiting for the product to be picked up that I needed, uh, he started asking me, so how's your day going? What are your plans for today? Uh, what'd you do this summer? So it was like, I was having this absolutely friendly conversation, but that's what they say they stand for. And they were repeating that at every mm. step, whether I call them or I was going in store to their service center, I was getting that same feeling again. And it's a reason why I go back to them, even that they're actually sometimes more expensive, but I know what I'm getting out of it. And I know that I can, re they're also trustworthy and reliable if anything does go wrong, but also this whole feeling of like, I feel good when I'm buying from them. Right. So it's that feeling that you want to bring about in every interaction with your clients. 
I love it. I love it because, you know, it's really, it's the definition of say what you're going to do, but then do it right? Don't just say we're touchy feely. Don't just say we're the company that makes you smile. It's like, you have to make me actually smile and yeah, hit all the points on way on where that could possibly happen. Right. It's it's the simplest thing. Okay. If we're a company that makes you smile, what are those three ways that we're going to do it? Don't have to come up with a list of 10 and then do those three things consistently across Mm. the various steps. Good if you're point, saying we're trying to make you smart and we're very transparent, okay, what does transparency mean to you as a company, right? It can mean different things for different companies. Write those three things down and say, and that's what it means to us. And this is what it doesn't. And that's what we're going to consistently bring about. So if you have those values that you have as a company, make and what makes you different as well. That's also where people forget. Uh, a lot of times, for example, people will say to me, well, I have the best quality. I said, well, what does the best quality mean? Is it mean that it's never going to break? <laughs> does it mean it's made in a certain way? Is it, what does it mean? And then when we get specific, I'm like, okay, so these are the three things. Then make that clear to your audience that these are the three things when you're talking about quality. These are the three things when you're talking about this. Uh, and then do that consistently and make sure it doesn't have to be a list of like 10 or 20 things. I love it. I love it. You know, that's something you could sit and really have an exercise with yourself on, right? It's like, this is a core value of my company, of me as a human, as a business owner. And these are three places where it can show up in my business. And these, this is three ways I can display it in my business. And these are the places that it's, I'm going to take the action on it. And then just always making sure if you're a solo, you're doing it every time. If you have a team, they're doing it every time. Yeah. Right? And, and again, also when I talked about the benefits that you, so how do you, you know, what does your product or service do and how does it make my audience feel? So I've worked with multiple jewelry brands, for example, and all of them will come with the word confidence. Mm. That I'm like, but okay, but what do you mean with that? You know, and then mm. when we once with the cust- combined with the customer understanding and what you're trying to achieve, we then dive in what that means. And with one client, for example, I had uh, she makes she she curates um, jewelry from different female designers. She's like, it's made by women for women, and her audience were women who were going through life changing moments. What that means was they mm. were either going maybe through a divorce. They were changing careers. They had kids who were now old enough and moving out of the house. They're getting empty nesters. But there was something happening in their life that was really changing. And they were like, it's time to be take care of myself and splurge for, and be, you know, for myself. Whereas I had another one who also talked about confidence. But her audience were women who had been through a lot. And they felt so comfortable in their own skin now that the jewelry was kind of a capturing of the journey they'd been through. So confidence meant com- two completely different things for these two people and then therefore how they show up and with the message mm. and changes as well. That's so interesting because you can visualize both feelings. You can visualize being in either, either one. And what's interesting, I think what your point is, and we have to hear this, is each of these jewelry designers, you know, entrepreneurs, they were using the word confidence, but they actually were meaning it in two very distinct ways. And until they worked with you and got to that clarity, how could their messaging be on point to each? Because if you just say confidence, maybe I'm thinking, well, I feel pretty good. I don't need jewelry to make me feel good. (laughs) Yeah, and and it shows. So the one who was going through life-changing moments, and she also herself as a character, she's pretty fun. And what these people wanted was just something light and fun. So she's always got these quotes, which are super funny and make you laugh that she shares. Uh, Mm. And the other one is more inspirational uh, Mm. and more down to earth. And it's a lot more about connection with nature coming up so it also just you know how you interact and how you pick up that phone whether it's going to be that more formal conversation good morning you're speaking with or hey hey there so nice to uh have you call us in today it's two different complete different ways but it represents your brand Mm. and and the thing is it's whenever we're talking about our brand and our messaging and our you know real client ideal client like it it is it is an introspective process you can't just you know, throw it at the wall and, and say, oh, that sounds good. It's like, you really do have to get very clear and it's, um, it's worth the time though, right? Absolutely. It's, it's one of the hardest things I think to take time out for, uh, for people. They, you know, it's, it's not something where I'm going to do this today. I'm immediately going to see, like, I'm spending more on advertising and immediate ROI in that sense, but it's an ROI that pays because it translates into everything you do. And imagine putting out content 
that really speaks to the hearts and minds of your customers. Imagine putting out yeah. that message and imagine providing the service and in a way that you do it in a way that actually really connects, deeply connects with them as well. And that's how you create that loyalty over a period of time and people that are going to be raving fans and going to be talking about you to others. I love it. I love it. Now, people work with you, Monica, in two particular ways. Number yes. one, first of all, I understand that you really only work one-on-one -on -one with people at this point. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So we have a 12-week program. Mm -hmm. And describe a little bit about who the 12-week program is for. So I'm listening. I love Monica. I want to get in her world. I want her to help me. Identify if, help me identify if I belong in your 12-week or what your one-year program. Yeah. So uh, in, it's for creative entrepreneurs. So you could have a product-based business or creative service providers. And uh, you are really looking to work from that bigger vision of that company that you have now and want to better communicate and connect with your audience without constantly feel like you're spinning your wheels and all that marketing and tactics just, just sometimes feel like they're not working and not converting and not connecting. Um, you are, I would say for any of the programs, you're definitely at least at 100K plus uh, mm -hmm. just from an investment point of view as well. And you feel like you're ready for that next level in your business. Either you feel like you're constantly stuck at that same stage or you've kind of outgrown where you are and you will need to move forward again and have clarity on that vision that you want to go to. So those are the two. And I would say for the 12 week, it's uh, once you're into the at least multi six figures is when I would say the 12 month makes more sense. Um, and that would be like 500 K plus I would then transitioning into the 12 month below that I would say is the 12 week. Um, and the 12 week, we work really on the fundamentals, understanding really into your why as well. Your purpose really drives you and your business. Who's that customer by really doing those deep dive customer interviews with my guidance, defining that brand, that messaging, making sure you align your services and products to that. Again, it could just be a refinement of that. And then deep diving into your numbers and defining that marketing plan uh, that we and strategy in that 12 weeks. And 12 months, we do this three months and then transition onto ongoing monthly support. It's like having a head of marketing or a CMO with you and coaching you in your business on an ongoing basis. So, okay. So that's an interesting thing that you just said right there. So when we, if we're, you know, 500 K or more, we can be thinking about the one year program, yeah. but the 12 weeks sort of happens, even if we might have a lot of this, you know, worked out, it just mm -hmm. means it's going to happen a little quicker and you're going to make us think, and we're going to be like, Oh, there's a little tweak to it, but blah, blah, blah. Um, but then at the three month mark at the, starting with the four, four month mark, the relationship sort of transitions to you almost being the CMO of our team in marketing so that, you know, we've defined what we're going to do, where we're going to go, how we're going to get there, what's the roads that we're going to take. And then if I've got two or three people on my team or one person, you are then meeting with that person or with me to make sure we're doing the execution of this. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So there'll be uh, monthly calls to make sure that, you know, you're clear on what you're doing for that month. Uh, saying, okay, because now we don't want to keep working, only thinking long term. It has to be short term. What, what needs to be implemented? What needs to be done? Making sure we look at the data that's happening for that month and making sure we really focus on that one key task for that month. Uh, and then a follow up call in around the third week to make sure that we are really uh, on point, but then ongoing Slack support throughout um, the whole month. And where I also review any kind of marketing material that you've created and things so that you have my eyes and ears and constantly make sure that you stay on point in line both with your brand that we've defined, in line with the goals that we've defined and where you're really heading to. And that way also, if things do change, you know, we've seen markets constantly change, surprise us. We're able to also tweak as we go along. Love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. So um, you have a download that we can get for free. Is that correct, Monica? Yes. Yeah, so the four Ds that I talked about, if you haven't been able to write them down, I have them for you. I've explained what each of those Ds are, my desires over demographics framework with a little check checklist under each D of what are the kind of things to focus on to ask about. So you can oh, download nice. a business with Monica forward slash uh, a well-designed. I'll, uh, you'll have the link under this. Um, and then you can download it from there. Okay. So a business with Monica.com forward slash a well-designed. Just well-designed. 
well designed, just well well designed. Okay, yeah. we'll put the link in the show yes. notes. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this has been so fun. And so, um, you know, just, you know, look, I've had a thousand conversations on branding and defining your brand. And of course, Nicole Heimer of Glory and Brand is my creative director. And we talk, you know, multiple times a weekday, month, a year about messaging and branding. But I always feel like there's some other thing to know or hear or learn about it. <laughs> like you just can't get enough, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I even, even for me, I've been doing this for what, over 18 years now. And I'm like, uh, even I'm constantly learning. Like we said, everything is changing and it's changing so fast in today's age. And I think also, especially over the last few years with COVID and then the whole market inflation, energy crisis, things we've been all faced as a society, things have changed drastically. And how we approach, you know, customer behaviors change, how we need to approach them. But I also feel as individuals, each one of us, I know I've been through a change. So from a branding and marketing perspective, there's just always something new to learn. And I love it that we can learn from each other. Yeah, 100%. Well, thank you tons for joining me today, Monica. I really do appreciate your conversation and your help today. Thank you for having me on. I really loved having this conversation with you. Monica said, and I agree, that marketing is fundamental to our businesses. And I love how Monica pointed out that no matter what form of marketing we are involved in, we need to understand that ultimately we are dealing with humans. There are all different facets and all different ways to market, but the key is that we need to understand who we are actually speaking to. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? You're not going to get anywhere trying to sell a carton of milk to someone who is lactose intolerant. So you might think you know who your target audience is, but Monica brought up a great point, and that is that the market changes, and with that, so do our clients and their behaviors. And I love that she made the clarification of who our real audience is over our ideal audience, okay? And she said that the ones who matter are the real people who are taking action and spreading the word about you. And I know what you're thinking. How are we supposed to determine our real versus our ideal ones, which is exactly why I asked her. And Monica said there are a couple of ways. The first is that it seems obvious, but might be worth saying, is that you need to analyze your data, your actual data. This is the things that you get from your website, from your email conversions to whatever it is. I don't care if you send postcards out by snail mail, keep track of any inquiries or any questions that come in from that marketing campaign. You have to track what you do so that you can know if it worked or it didn't work, okay? I love the other um, suggestion that she made, which is to have the conversations with your current best favorite clients. Okay, I mentioned how Susan Brunstrom does this as an autopsy project, but having it specifically related to your marketing is also a nice idea. Um, I can tell you that Nicole Heimer encouraged all of us. Anybody that has worked with Nicole Heimer, you know that she encourages you to do this, okay? And the thing is, There's so much value that comes up when you have these conversations with your clients. First of all, first, we talked about it in the show, just them feeling seen and heard, right? You've just spent weeks, months, years in their lives. Them asking you, what do I think? What do you think? What do you think? Should I use this lamp? Should I use this sofa? Should I use this paint? Now you're asking them what they think. That feels good. I think that would feel good. Okay. So, and the other thing is, is that you really learn things. If you take the time to do it quietly and carefully with them, you learn things that might surprise you. And I also highly encourage you not to avoid the simple direct question of why did you choose me over someone else? Often you will learn things about yourself, your company, your deliverables that you had no idea were the game changer in your company. And that is super powerful, okay? So once you've gotten to the bottom of who your real clients are and you've got some information about them, then you will usually find that your messaging needs tweaking, which is great, okay, because you can do it. You might find that you are using a word that isn't accurately representing what you actually mean, like the example Monica gave with her client who curates jewelry and you use the word confidence in their messaging, okay? So the key is to be consistent across the board in 
what you learn, right? So how you serve your clients, be consistent, then how you speak to them and attract them to you, be consistent. Have it go through your brand in all the ways. Okay. If you'd like to work with Monica to lock down your marketing, there are two ways to work with her. She offers a 12 week program or a one year program. Both programs are ideal for you if you are at a hundred K or more in gross revenue. Okay. And you are looking to get to the next level. She's also offering a free download desires over demographic framework, and it includes a checklist to get yours. Go to businesswithmonica.com forward slash well designed businesswithmonica.com forward slash well designed. It will also be in the show notes. Okay. Now, you know, I can't leave with just saying we're getting very close to Luann Live. You can still join us if you want. Uh, go to luannlive.com to learn about all the amazing people that we have coming. And I'm so looking forward to co-hosting this event with my daughter, Christy Rocha. And it is called Health and Wealth, a well-designed business within a well-designed life. If that sounds like a room that you want to be in, I encourage you to go to luannlive.com and I'll see you very very soon. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.